Hey everybody, it is time once again for another Rado Q&A. And hello everybody, I'm about to answer a bunch of questions submitted by folks like you to the email address questions at rado.com. And by all means folks, if anything I talk about or my wife talks about, because she sometimes shows up on these as well, prompts any further questions from you, well you know what to do. Questions at rado.com is the email address. Keep them coming, folks. I want to hear your cues so I can am. And speaking of which, let's get right to it. But, folks, I'm going to talk about several different topics today. And if any of them don't really strike your fancy, don't worry. There are links down in the show notes that let you jump around from question to question so you can listen to just the parts you're interested in. All right, sound good? Then let's go. <clears throat> Alrighty, Gerald says, question one. Did you ever try your Orléans idea for the Automa in Expeditions with Jen? Reveal the Automa card, but don't resolve it. I feel... I, uh, I don't remember for sure. I don't think I did. I think that was just hypothesis on my part. Because, I mean, I could... Uh, between playing that and now, I've played probably 150 more games with Jen. And I, I genuinely don't remember, but I'm pretty... It's unlikely because I rarely have the time to go back. Hey, I filmed the thing. I could go back and play it more, but nope, I've got another dozen games in my queue that i got to work on them. In fact, I, I could tell you I got rid of Expeditions. I, my copy of Expeditions went to the Dice Tower West Convention Library. Um, and because... Why bother? I mean, I've got plenty of other games that do a great job with two-player, and I didn't think Expedition did. I, th I, th I thought there were things Expedition could have done to tighten up the two-player experience, and they didn't do it. And it, it's not my job to fix the game for my tastes. I've got plenty of other games I can play. So I, I never circled back. But I have a copy of Expeditions again. And I don't know how much I can talk about this. I did look this up because somebody asked me somewhere... And Jamie Stegmeier has gone on record saying that they are developing an expansion for expeditions. Uh, you know, he's mentioned this in several of his like you know uh, letters to his you know so so that's public knowledge. What's not public knowledge is what's in that expansion. I have some firsthand knowledge of what's in that expansion, and all I'll say is I now have a copy of Expeditions again. Why? I'm not going to say, because I'm not supposed to talk about stuff that hasn't been announced yet. All I can say is, hey, I personally have a copy of Expeditions again, for some reason. And hey, Jamie Stegmeier has gone on record saying they are working on an expansion. You can put two and two together there. <laughs> I'm excited. Uh, question two, Gerald. Uh, I think you said that you almost got rid of Ottawa until you played it solo, and the solo in-game objectives, one big one per game, save the game for you. Do you think you'd enjoy competitive plays of Ottawa and other Rose or, uh, and another Rosenberg sandbox game, uh, Feast for Odin, a lot more if you had a few private short-term objectives like we see in Holler Taliedo and Lord's Heart? Oh, of course, yes. It's always striking to me. There are some things that when a game just doesn't bother to do, it's like... Uh, practically bare minimum. Geez, again, do you want your game to fail? This has been proven over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. The players love this stuff. And then you don't put it in the game? Things like unique player abilities, um, personal objectives. You know, just those two things alone. A game without those is infinitely, hugely catapulted into a much higher quality experience by including those. And every time a game doesn't do it, it just makes my mind boggle. So, yeah. I'm 100% I'm, I'm confident I would be. 100%. Question 3. On your previous Rado Q&A, a uh, listener asked a question about sharing control of a third character in a two-player game. Perhaps it was Pandemic. Yeah, I believe so. Yes, I think it was uh, Top uh, making a big impassioned speech for Pandemic is best played with players controlling multiple characters. You should try it. Anyway, you said that you don't like it when two-player mo when two-player modes do this, as it takes you out of the experience of being one character. Fresco, however, is in your top fifty games of all time, in which you share control over Leonardo. Uh, since it's in your top fifty, I guess you must really enjoy that, or it doesn't annoy you enough to knock it down a few ranks. Why do you think that implementation works so well for you? And I'll give you another example. You could have also mentioned um, Seven Wonders. Seven Wonders for the longest time was in my top ten highest ranked games of all time. I think the game is that good, and I believe the game is that good in large part because of the two-player free city, which is a uh, a third um, opponent 
You know, there's me and you playing, and then there's the free city, who could potentially win the game, but we are sharing control over that third city, trying to wend it towards our benefit and not the opponent's. Why do I like that? Because the reality is, um, in Seventh uh, Wonders, I don't feel like I am a, a singular individual person with a goals and agency running around the world or the city or whatever the simulation is trying to achieve objectives. I am, by definition, in almost all Euro games, a disembodied middle manager trying to make sure all the pieces fall into place. So, um, as soon as you throw in the free city of Seven Wonder or Seven Wonders or Leonardo in Fresco, that just becomes one more cog in all the different pieces I was already playing with. Um, now it's interesting you mentioned Fresco because Fresco is that rarest of beasts. It is a uh, a Euro style game that really does make you feel like you are a singular individual. But here's the deal: um, it's because I sh- it's it's because. I still feel like I am that Renaissance era contemporary of Leonardo da Vinci, um, who's getting out of bed in the morning, heading down to get my paints, working on the chapel and all that. And it just so happens that in my day job, I happen to be friends with this other guy, this Leonardo guy. And I can, in addition to everything else I do in my day-to-day life, I can kind of influence him a little bit to go do something that favors me. To me, that enhances the storytelling of the game, as opposed to what Top was suggesting for Pandemic, where, hey, why don't you just put a third character on the game who is 100% a completely functional character of their own and then share control of that character? You could make the argument that, yeah, it's the same thing. We just, you know, and I believe that's the argument Top made. But it doesn't feel the same to me. Maybe because Pandemic and everything Top was talking about is a cooperative game, um, as opposed to Fresco, and Seven Wonders, and pretty much any other game that does this, although there are very few games that do it. Um, Waterfall Park could have done it, though. It would have been wise. Uh, It's pretty rare that uh, games do this, but I think maybe it's because it's the difference between a competitive game and a cooperative game. If I'm playing cooperative with you, I want this to be about me and you. And hey, look at me. I'm now trying to... I'm I'm getting a bit hoity-toity in the same way I was complaining about that small contingent of players who doesn't think it's a valid game experience to have a a dummy player. I'm Well, I've I've got my wants and needs for them, too. Um, And don't get me wrong. I mean, it's, it's not like... I mean... What is it called? Time Stories. Time Stories, which Jen and I played through the entire first cycle, the white cycle, is that right? It's called? We played through the whole thing from start to finish with a homebrew variant that I had to make because the game was designed to be three-player minimum and its two-player official rules were garbage. Absolute garbage. But I wanted to play the game so much that I came up with my own two-player rules where we shared control over a third player. But here's the difference between Leonardo or the uh, sidekick that we came up with in um, Time Stories, or the Free City, as opposed to what Top suggested. I'm literally just thinking this out loud myself, trying to see... Because, I mean, to me, I, I just intuitively, instinctually understand this, and I'm trying to put into words, why do I feel this way? In all those cases where I liked it, it was not a full character. It was not a fully realized character who, in in any other time, oh, we would just have a third person at the table controlling this third character. Um, you know, because that character is capable of doing everything, has the same level of depth and complexity as what we're doing. Um, Leonardo is not a full, uh, you know, autonomous character with their own set of abilities and uh, resources and all that. They're just a simple little tool in the game. Uh, same for the Free City. Same for the sidekick rules I came up with for Time Stories. But that's not what Top came up with. But now, if Top had suggested... one of Which one is it? I want to say it was On the Brink. Was it the On the Brink expansion for Pandemic that introduced the CDC as another vo- uh, character, another actor in the game? It was a way to basically turn Pandemic into a solo game, right? Where, okay, I'm just playing by myself. I just have one character, but there's a CDC. And the CDC is a quasi-character who has their own archive of cards, um, exists in a particular place, and just gives me some extra powers while the CDC is active. And the interesting thing is, um, you know, that's designed for solo, but Jen and I then took the CDC character, and what was it? Oh, we we combined that as a homebrew variant with the, um, what do you call it, the... 
I forget what it's called, the bioterrorist from the second expansion. Um, on the brink, right? In the labs came later. That's the CDC. On the brink had the bioterrorist thing. The bioterrorist thing is not particularly good as a two-player experience. It's really designed for, hey, there's one sneaky player moving around and hiding, and the other players are all trying to figure out where they are, you know, hidden movement style game. But then what we did is, okay, I'll be the, the hero and I'll have the CDC helping me. So I'm effectively playing the solo game against you, the uh, bioterrorist sneaking around trying to, you know, spread the cubes and all of that. And that worked really well. Uh, I worked surprisingly well. I, th- I think that should be an official set of rules. If they ever do a pandemic big box, Matt Leacock put that in the box. It was, it was really neat. Um, but again, the CDC and Leonardo and um, you know the things I've done in the past. Or oh, another good example, the sidekicks you have in Oathsworn. I was very excited about the sidekicks in Oathsworn, too, because Oathsworn requires there be four hero characters, even if you're only playing a two-player game. But what you can do is you can say, oh, if you're playing solo or you're playing two-player, hey, I'll just have my one character who's big and complex with the battle flow system, and he'll have some sidekicks who have just a very simple strip down, streamlined set of rules. And I thought that was going to be amazing until I actually played it. And I found out that the sidekick characters are more complex than any pandemic character. And it was like, okay, it's still too much. Those They need to be streamlined and, and simplified down a lot more. I mean, one of my favorite things about Gloomhaven that puts it so high on my list is I love, and I wish more games would do this, but no game does this. I love the way that you had your... Um, Familiars, you know, whether you're summoning, you know, robots or, or um, you know, uh, uh, swarms of rats or you know, uh, fire demons that work under your control, you don't control them. They were their own independent that followed basically the same rules as the bad guys, but it's just that they're on your side, so they chase down the bad guys. I always loved that. Um, and I don't think I would love it anywhere near as much if I had full auto, uh, you know, autonomous control over that. Um, I mean, I guess for all of these, the consistent thing is when it introduces something new and novel to the game that makes it richer and more interesting, uh, not by just saying, oh yeah, just throw some more characters in, but no, throw this new system in. That's what gets my blood pumping. That's what gets me excited. And that's why I like Leonardo. Maybe it's not has nothing to do with co-op. Maybe it just has to do with the way these extra sidekicks are implemented. <clears throat> Next up. Hal says, so, I guess I have a couple questions that are related, but I need to go into a bit of history. I always enjoy your thoughts on games you preview. The fact that you seem heavily into theme and mechanisms is great, although the latter can pull away from the curtain from the former at times. I have to admit, there have been a couple instances where I was excited for something, but having me- mechanical aspects of the game pointed out cooled me pretty quick. Not a huge problem, since this hobby does not lack for things to be excited about, but one game where you totally caught me off guard was the U.S. version of Bastion. Bastion. Man, I must have covered this a long time ago. I mean, I've covered now close to 2,000 games on the channel. I'll have to look. Maybe maybe I'll remember it as you talk. All right. It never occurred to me that this was Pick Up and Deliver. I was somewhat new to the hobby and able to shrug it off because I love the feeling of directing my character across the board, fighting off monsters. And ma- oh, it's a very blue game, isn't it? The, isn't the board really blue? And we're running around. There's like a castle in the middle. And we're, yeah, we're having to get stuff and take it other places to build the defenses for the monsters. I think that's what Bastion is. Anyway. Um, I love feeling directing my characters across the board, fighting monsters with magic spells. So I guess my first question is, knowing there are some mechanisms that you don't enjoy? Has any game's theme eventually won you over uh, when you were initially completely turned off by them? Uh, Now going back to Bastion. All right, okay, let's see. I'm sure that must be the case. Knowing there are some mechanisms you don't enjoy, that um, the theme of the game, not other mechanisms, or the overall... That's interesting. The theme of the game. I don't know. You're right, I do love theme. There are certainly... I mean, there are pick-up-and-deliver games that I love. But it's not because of the theme. I don't love Great Heartland, um, Great Heartland Hauling Company as a pick up and deliver game because of the theme, and that lets me overcome my distaste for pick up and deliver in general. I love that game because of the way it does multi use cards, and it's just absolutely brilliant. So it's generally other mechanisms that will overcome my 
lack of enthusiasm for a particular mechanism. Is there any theme that has ever done that? Is there a theme that I love so much that just it being there will overcome my distaste for a mechanism? Like what happened with you and Bastion? Wow, I don't think so. I'm going to go to ranked.rado.com. And I'm going to come back over here to the browser. And I'm going to make these pictures big. I'm just going to do a quick scan. Because I don't think it's happened, buddy. Um, right, well, first of all, if it did happen, it wouldn't be in my top rated games of all time. It would be something probably lower. So let's go to like the second page. See um, some lower level games if this has ever happened. Um, I'm looking at all these games. Oh, I found one. Right here. <laughs> Marvel Champions. I freaking hate Roll to Resolve. Hate it with a passion. Um, it was discussed about it earlier in this very podcast. And, you know, a game that makes you do it a lot, don't care for. Marvel Champions makes you do it a lot. Uh, well, kind of, sort of. It's it's more it's with the bad guys when, when the bad guys do their thing there and I could prepare for it and they're going to attack and I'm okay I'm going to put these defenses in but then I got to flip a card and ha ha you just wasted and you just got the Hawkeye killed for no good reason and it's a wait yo and all that any other game I would hate that it's Marvel make mine Marvel I'm a I'm a child of the 70s uh, when I had spare money as a kid. In the in, in in 77, I would go down to the local uh, 7-Eleven and I would buy comic books off the stand. And, and Spider-Man was my favorite. I still have fond memories of... Remember in the 70s? Anybody listening remember in the 70s? Those uh, Marvel uh, issues of comics that they would include a, uh, a 45 record that you could play that had like a fully acted out audio drama with special effects and music and, and, and they, were, they were awesome. I still remember... Uh, Spider-Man fighting uh, Man-Wolf, and you know, the sound of the rain was so well done, at least to my eight-year-old ears. So yeah, Marvel Champions is an example. If if Marvel Champions had been DC or Wildstorm or just you know, hey, let's make up our own superhero characters, I probably at the time would have said, yeah, that's nice, that, that that's neat, but yeah, I'm probably gonna pass. Whereas for the longest time, Marvel Champions was in my top ten of all time. Uh, so yeah, there's an example of one. I didn't think I'd find one, but I found one without hard, working too hard. So I guess it can happen. Um, and then along the same lines, Star Trek Expeditions, because I love Star Trek. My two favorite franchises in the universe are Marvel, superheroes, and Star Trek. So yeah, those are both examples. Interestingly, another one I really love, uh, Game of Thrones. But and my love for Game of Thrones did not make me fall in love with the... Uh, you know the 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 outright warfare of this game, so that was a case where it didn't work. But yeah, it's it's it. I guess it has happened. Anyway, now going back to Bastion, one I'm gonna have to look this game up. <laughs> You're still talking about it. One aspect of the game that I th I thoroughly enjoy is how the game has a dramatic shift once the last card is dealt from the monster deck. Up until then, when difficulty is upped, I am spending much of my time on my heels reacting to things on my heels. Uh, reacting to things. Dealing with new creatures that are coming out while maximizing what the board will give me. All while balancing fires, trying to improve your characters, dealing with deadly combos, and um, weighing to save or use magic. <clears throat> There's a bunch of analysis paralysis involved, and I never really am sure what the best move is running two characters solo. But once the final monster card is placed, it's like that moment in the Matrix where time stops, and I'm completely in control of how the rest of the game plays out. I mentally crack my knuckles, and I'm thinking, okay, fiends, my turn. It makes, uh, it makes the stress from the first half totally worth it. So the second question is, do you have a game that you really like where you have that dramatic shift of being on your heels, but eventually can turn the tables and feel like you're in control of things. Uh, for more of a challenge, maybe pick something outside tower defense. First of all, I gotta, I gotta say, uh, or front, uh, Hal, great job. Talk about evocative um, ode to your one of your favorite games. Now I feel bad that I don't remember Bastion at all. That sounds really cool. Um, did I appreciate that when I covered it? I don't know. Or would I, would I say, ah, pick up and deliver? I, I don't know. Who knows? Anyway, though, that's an interesting thing. Uh, hmm. I, I would say that is something 
a really great cooperative game gives you that feeling repeatedly throughout the game. And it's what I've often mentioned. It, it, why, often, if I play a pandemic-style game and I think, oh, this falls so short, it's because, I've talked about this before, uh, a lot of co-op games have a model where it's just a mountain. And uh, things start off bad, and they just get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And we're just plummeting to our death as we just accelerate out of control, and we're holding on for dear life, hoping that we can somehow pull off a win against all odds. And there's nothing wrong with that, but that's not my favorite way to go. Because I find much more engaging uh, is the what I call the pandemic, the roller coaster, where things seem terrible. Things seem unsolvable. We are doomed. And we are, oh my gosh, how are we gonna how are we gonna face this? And but we come up with some clever moves and we make it through that, and then we think, oh, we've got breathing room. We can we we're in control. We have a chance now. We can turn this around. And that feeling is very short-lived because then the boom, the, the game hammers us again from a different direction. Um, because, you know, in Pandemic, uh, another one of the uh, Epidemic cards, and now, now we got to reshuffle, and suddenly we're getting big triple hits again where we thought we had control, and, we, and suddenly, oh, we're scrambling. I love that. And a, and a great co-op game gives you that uh, repeatedly over and over. And uh, to me, a less engaging co-op game is one that doesn't, that is very one-note. Ghost Stories uh, is, I think, the famous archetype for this. But I've played other co-op games that do this as well. They just go from bad to worse to worse to worse to worse to worse, and then you win or you lose. That's much less compelling. All right, finally. Uh, this is more of an observation I want to run by you. Returning to Bastion. Much of the challenge comes from mixing of mana wells on the board. For me, it seems like there's much more efficient ways to sort things out, but I get the I get that the challenge comes from spending different mana types across the sections. Still, I tend to notice <clears throat> this is common in many games. Rather than picking the better option, I find myself picking the least mediocre or the least bad. Adding to this is mini games give you large numbers of these choices, obfuscating any clear advantage when comparing them, except the rare occasion where it stands out. Many will probably disagree, but Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion seems built around this. I almost feel like pick the least bad option should be a labeled mechanism. Thoughts? Yeah. That's... I mean, and it's not just for cooperative games. That's true for a, a truly great design. Um, if if you can, through a little bit of calculation, identify this is clearly the thing to do. I should do nothing other than this. If I do anything other than this, I am I'm, I'm making a terrible mistake, and it's not worth even considering anything else. That's the sign of a less than ideal design for a game. A game should be drowning you with options, or not drowning, but you should certainly be presented with a a potpourri of options, none of which are perfect, all of which are forcing you to compromise. And the tough choice comes from, well, okay, am I going to sacrifice that to achieve this? Am I going to sacrifice this to achieve that? Am I going to go for this milk toast middle one that will not actually achieve either of these things, but I'm making progress towards both? All three of these options are equally viable. Which way do I go? Let's see how it works out. That's truly, truly great game design. And... If you're ever playing a game and you can't, I just the game just doesn't really engage me much. I'm just not pulled in. Chances are it's because they're not giving you that. And um, you know, that's uh yeah, I, I completely agree. And I now I feel like I need to go out and check out my run through of Bastion again. Okay. James says, number one, have you used the uh, board game stats app? I recently became addicted to it. I'm a data nerd and I love the stat charts it creates. I am pretty sure I have got it in my shortcuts, don't I? Um, let's see. Let me look here. BGG stats. Let's look at that. Board game stats. Playing, tracking, collection, management, the stats app. Um, oh, no. This is a standalone app that you install on your phone. No. My answer to your question, James, is no. I have never heard of this. But it looks interesting. Um, wow, it makes pie charts and stuff. I, I, I've seen stuff like this. But, um, you know, like one, I uh, see, I look at my shortcuts. Uh, one is Board Game Geek Collection History, which is uh, geekgroup.app. 
Uh, this is a great, great site that lets you drill down on your collection and, and find statistical stuff. Um, you know, and I, you know, often I use it for. Man, three years ago I changed the rating on this game. Why did I do that? Did I rate it up or down? And this keeps track of it. So there are definitely. Uh, but no, I've not heard of BG Stats. Uh, I'll have to look at it. Uh, thanks for the heads up. Number two, in a previous Q&A, you brought up issues with Board Game Geek's rating and weight systems. You made good points, but I think the real problem with the weight system is that I believe most people don't know it's a rating they can affect. When you bring up a page for a game you haven't yet rated, you see a band of blank stars that says my rating next to it, prominently in the center above the buttons. But the weight is smaller and in the exact same format as players times age. It looks like any other permanent feature of the game. Uh, if you even know that you can give input on the weight, you first have to click on view results, which brings you to a sidebar of the voting results. Then you click on go to poll, then select your option, then click vote. Uh, rating the game itself is as easy as clicking stars on the game page. So the problem is a tiny fraction of people that rate the game will give input on its weight. Firstly, because they don't know uh, they can, and second, because it's not convenient. I clicked on a random game, Veil of Attorney, and it says it has 900 ratings, but only th- or 905 ratings, but only 31 weight votes. The first thing BGG can do to fix the weighting of games is to make it the same type of input as the ratings right there on the main page next to my game ratings. Let's go to Board Game Geek. And uh, uh, look at a game. Um, go to the front page of Board Game Geek. Hey, Nick Starla. And let's look at the Dead Keep, just arbitrarily. And um, yeah, I have to admit, I don't know how to do it either. I mean, yeah, obviously, if I wanted to rate this, I could just do that right here. If I look at weight, complexity rating, how do you even do it? I don't even know how to do it. What do you have to do? I have to click, all right. View results? Was it over here? What do you say I have to do? The weight? It looks like any other permanent feature. You have to know that you can give input on the weight. You have to click on view results. I don't even see the word view results. View results. I'm searching word, not um, the browser. View results. I don't even see where this thing is you can click. I mean, I know I've, I, I think I've done it. Is it community stats? Ratings breakdown, average, weight. Yeah, here you go. So you got to go into the stats subpage. Then you got to click on weight. Then you can click on this. Then, oh, looks like nobody, I, I picked a game that nobody has actually rated because of course nobody's played it. That was a bad choice. Let's try to pick a game people have actually played, shall we? Let's scroll down a little bit more and just get into um, Matainai. Fine. And then I'll go back up to Matainai and then go to, where was it? I've lost it again. Oh, stats and... Uh, oh, and now it's now I just got nothing but ratings. My God, average ratings. Number, view more. View more stats. Then wait. Then okay. Although no, this just lets me see them. I don't see. I, I, you even told me how to do it, and I can't figure it out. And you're right. That is very weird. That is really strange. Why? Yeah, because I. I mean, you'd think I'd be able to click on. Oh, I, I can. Wow. Jeez, yeah, that's that is freaking invisible. You're right, there it is. And then I can go to poll, and then I can mark it. Um, so you're right, that's absurd. That's absurd. There are a few absurd things that have been waiting for years. That is one of them. My personal favorite for absurdities on Board Game Geek is trying to delete a game from your. If I if I got rid of um, Motani, not that I would. It's a great game, um, but I'd have to go to my collection. I have to edit. Then I have to click these dots. Then I have to say delete from collection. Then I have to say yes, confirm delete. What is that? That's like five or six clicks I've got to do to delete something from my collection? That's absurd. So yeah, make no mistake. There are definitely... There's room for improvement on Board Game Geek. No two ways about it. But it is interesting. The, the fact that it is so well hidden. And I've been on Board Game Geek for over a decade and I didn't know how to do it. Um... What is the end result of that? What that means is, I, I'm, I'm trying to put a positive spin on this. That heck, maybe Board Game Geek even wants to keep this a secret feature. The problem that we were ta- that I was talking about when this topic was brought up earlier is, you know, uh, you know, BGG ratings and weight. They're kind of meaningless. There's no standard that people can apply. Right, uh, you know, board game doesn't even try. In theory, you know, they have a thing saying, "Oh, this is what a three is. This is what a seven is." And it's, um, in oh, 
By the way, I just noticed this entire time my wife's picture is on the screen throughout all of this. Silly me. She's not here. She's not going to get here till later. I should have hid that. Eh. Anyway, that uh, doesn't matter. It's a very good picture of her. So, what was I saying? Oh, um, man, now I'm totally flummoxed. <sighs> right. Uh, you know, even if they did make the weight obvious to people, if you then suddenly got a opened a floodgate of people weighing stuff and all they have is, oh, it's a one, two, three, four, or five. What does that mean uh, to people? If they're not going to do the extra work, if they're not going to do to say, hey, okay, let's open it up. Let's make sure everybody understands about the weighting system. But let's say that when they choose to weight some, to weigh something, don't have me choose numbers one, two, three, four, or five. Look, I mean, if, I mean, if they really took the time, they'd look at my collection, right? And they'd say, oh, I own Ticket to Ride, and I own Gloomhaven, and I own uh, Fresco, and I own, you know, and they say, well, you know, what of, you know, of these five games that we know you've played because it's in your collection and you've marked that you've played them, what would you say this is comparable to? That would be a truly useful system. Now, you know, that's a lot of work. Um, <clears throat> And, you know, barring that, just having some kind of touchstone, you know, is this, you know, again, I, I, like I said this before, these things should be presented not as just hard, cold numbers, but more of a series of questions. Is this game comparable to, is, is, do you feel this game would be good for people who have never played board games? Do you feel this game uh, would be an appropriate difficulty level for a truly experienced players? Something like that. And I think in the absence of doing that, opening it up so that more people could weigh games would largely produce random static noise. At least now, and again, I'm trying to put a positive spin on this, because it's so hidden, it's so obfuscated, it is only known to the you, and I didn't even know it, to a few people. At least in that way, you're getting a more consistent rating and it's probably from people who have probably played a lot of games and you know have a wide breadth of experience if they even know where to find this thing. So maybe you're getting a more elite and therefore consistent breakdown. Maybe it's a good thing. I'm just hypothesizing though. That was ridiculous how hard that was to find. I mean, God, it was practically um, you know invisible. <clears throat> All right, moving on. Joseph says I have a series of questions related to the Legends of Andor. These questions come from my last play session of the game. My friend and I started from the tutorial and attempted the first real mission. We played as the wizard, can flip the die. As a result, and the warrior gets more health back from the well. Although I felt we were playing well, we ended up losing the game. The minions overwhelmed our castle. I don't ask you to recall the details of the scenario, uh, but players basically need to defeat a supercharged minion on one side of the map, capture an item from another minion for a different side of the map, and of course protect the castle from being overrun. Between two players, we found this series of tasks overwhelming. Additionally, we were at a loss for how to deal with the onslaught of creatures. You may remember, not only is combat a fairly large investment of time and energy, but the lore counter progresses a step every time you successfully defeat an enemy. We have done better. I was frankly shocked shocked that we struggled to even complete one of the earlier missions. We felt like the tasks were spread very thin between the two of us. With this context in mind, please answer the following questions. One, have you and Jen played through every scenario of the base game? Yes, I have. Yes, we have. We have. Two, did you succeed on the first attempt of every scenario? No, definitely not. We never succeeded the first time. This game, it's a really odd beast, Legends of Andor, especially because it won the Spiel des Jahres. I think it came out before, or maybe it won the Kenner Spiel, but I think it won the Spiel des Jahres. And I know the reason why, because it, I mean, it was one of the first games ever to come with a built-in tutorial that was straight out of a video game. You know, that first mission that just basically baby steps you through everything. And so they, it was getting the award for best game of the year because it did that. Um, you know, don't get me wrong, it's a great game too, but that is why it was there. And then it's, it, you know, you play that and you're like, okay, I think I got this game. I understand how it works. And then they throw you into the second mission and it's, it feels impossible. It feels like this is literally, and I'm sure that's what you're talking about, this is impossible to complete. How could anybody do this? Because the one thing the tutorial doesn't teach you is monster management. 
um, which is the, the the secret sauce. It's what makes Andor so special. The fighting, the questing, the, the beautiful art, none of that. All that is secondary to monster management. Um, and that's the one thing the tutorial does not teach you, that they expect you to figure out on your own. And I think a lot of people get to that second mission, say, oh my god, this is impossible, and then get rid of the game. Because the game doesn't do anything to help players over that really... What's it called? Um... What's the word? I can't think of the word. Um, where it's not obvious. Unintuitive. It's incredibly unintuitive that you are punished. You are penalized for fighting monsters. And this, the trick to uh, winning the game at any chapter you play, no matter the player count, is to identify which monsters you have to kill and which monsters you have to let live. And the solution for identifying them has nothing to do with their relative strength. Well, it has not much to do with their relative strengths and all that. It has to do with which monsters are going to move two turns from now into a position that they will cause a daisy chain that lets monsters monsters hopscotch over each other and overrun. You have to... It's like monsters are creating supply lines. As they move forward towards the castle along those set paths, those paths are designed so that the monsters will interfere with each other and monsters will start hopping over each other and double-timing it to the castle. And so you have to identify, right, if we just take out this one little dinky monster, it will slow down these other five monsters. And so that is the only one we fight, just that one monster, and we leave all those other monsters alone and let them now slowly work their way towards the castle. Um, that's the trick of the game. And they really missed a trick by not making that obvious to players. Because anybody's just going to assume, right, oh, we got to fight more monsters. And the more you fight, the more you're going to lose. Um, anyway, though, sorry. Would you say Legends of Andor is much more difficult to two players? I have played Legends of Andor many times as a two player. I've only ever played it once as a four player game. But I played it as a four-player game knowing the tricks. And I couldn't tell you. I, we won when we played as a four-player game. Um, but I don't feel like we won any more handily than when Jen and I win as a two-player game. It's a hard game. But it's only hard because it obfuscates, it hides the secret strategy you need to win. It gives you no... And, and it's a real mistake. It's a real mistake on the part of the publisher. And that's why so many people play that second mission and then just give up in despair because they think it's unwinnable. When in fact, they just didn't teach you they didn't, they didn't make you unlearn the lessons you've learned from other games. That fighting is actor, actually bad. And you have to do it very sparingly with precision. Laser precision. Anyway, do you have any tips for beginners of the game? Is question four. I think I just did, right? Now, hopefully, that's that's the trick. That's 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 everything right there. It's identifying, thinking about, right, what's going to happen two turns from now when that monster has moved into this position and that monster has moved into this position? Oh, crap. That troll is going to be able to jump three steps forward and we're going to lose. How do we stop that from happening? It's not beating the troll. It's making sure that troll goes really slow. Um, and that's the trick. That's the puzzle. Okay, uh, and it's what makes Andor so cool, um, but very different. And that will be the end of this session of the Rado Q&A. Thank you, folks, for watching and also for submitting your questions. Send me more to the email address questions at rado.com, and I'll get you covered in a future episode. And in the meantime, if you would like to hear some more, you're in luck. I have been doing the Rado Talks Through audio podcast for years now with my wife, Jen, and we have got hundreds of hours for you to enjoy. You can hit that big box that's on screen right now if you want to dive deep. Also, you can go on ahead and subscribe so you won't miss the next Rotto Q&A. And uh, thank you folks for watching, for listening. Have a very, very nice day. Talk to you later. So long. Uh, bye bye